Good morning. Welcome to the annual ARC virtual summit, our first virtual summit. I'm John Kerry, state alternate to ARC for Ohio Governor Mike DeWine. Just a few housekeeping items before we get started. With the large number of participants, everyone has been automatically muted. If you have a question for one of our panelists, please send one through the chat box. 2020 has been an historic year for us all as we face the challenges of being in a pandemic. Today you will hear how innovation and ingenuity are being harnessed by both public and private partners in the region to address the COVID-19 crisis. In the next few weeks, we'll be highlighting many of the region's strong partnerships, including Ohio's own Eastgate, Ohio Mideast Government Association, Ohio Valley Regional Development Commission, and Buckeye Hills Regional Council. A thank you goes out to Ohio's LDDs for their help in putting this conference together. Buckeye Hills as a host LDD deserves a special shout out. Thank you, Misty Crosby and your team for your hard work. I'm very fortunate to work with Program Manager Julia Hinton and Program Coordinator Austin Ward in the Governor's Office of Appalachia. And of course, this never would have happened without the support of the ARC staff. Thank you for all of your hard work. Today, you will hear from State Co-Chair Governor DeWine, ARC Federal Co-Chair Tim Thomas, along with Appalachian Institute Fellow Tiffany Swigert, Geshockton, Ohio, about leadership in response to COVID-19. This session will be moderated by Ohio Development Services Agency Director Lydia Mahalik. Director Mahalik is a former mayor with a background in community and economic development. She has been an example of reacting quickly to respond to COVID challenges by creating the PPE loan program, investing in the minority business loan program, and also investing $10 million in the Appalachian Growth Capital Loan Program. It is my honor to introduce Director Mahali. Well, thank you, uh, Director Kerry, and uh, good morning, everyone. It's a real pleasure uh, to be here with you today. Uh, we appreciate all the work and effort that has gone into putting together what I feel is going to be a really quality program. Um, it's my honor to introduce to you uh, a, a gentleman who I've really enjoyed working for uh, over the last year and a half, although it's been certainly an, an unprecedented time. Uh, this, uh, this governor's uh, commitment to public service uh, is, is absolutely amazing. And he's put a, a ton of emphasis on, on the way that the state has responded to the COVID-19 crisis. Um, and he's also pushed us as a cabinet uh, to really look at ways that we can make life better uh, for Ohioans. And it's a real honor uh, to be able to serve with him. And the Appalachian region uh, is going to be incredible by the time uh, we're done with this term here, Governor. Uh, so it's my, it's my pleasure to introduce to you uh, all this after or this morning, uh, Governor Mike DeWine. Well, Lydia, thank you very much, uh, Director. We appreciate that uh, very, very much. Um, both uh, John Kerry uh, and Director Mahalik uh, both were former mayors. And so I think that's a good, uh, uh, good background uh, for what they're doing uh, right now. I uh, want to welcome everybody to Ohio. Um, those of you who are not from Ohio, uh, I'm talking from our home in, in Cedarville, which is southwest Ohio, pretty close to, to Dayton and to Springfield. But uh, our, our only regret in this, uh, at least a beautiful day in southwest Ohio, is that we're not in Marietta. Uh, Marietta is one of our favorite places for Fran and my wife Fran and, and me to go uh, right on the Ohio River. Uh, just a beautiful, beautiful river, beautiful part of, of Ohio. Uh, it was also the first permanent settlement uh, of Ohio, and uh, a great book, if you want to read a little bit about uh, some of the pioneers, uh, is a book by um, David McCullough, and the name of the book is The Pioneers, and it tells about the settlement in the late 1700s, uh, settlement of that, that, that part of Ohio. So it's a, it's a, it's a great book, and uh, it's a lot of a lot of fun to read. Also uh, in Marietta is Marietta College. And so and if you have children that are looking for a beautiful place to go to school, Marietta uh, College would be a, a great place. Uh, in, Ap in Ohio, uh, our Appalachian region really runs from the north to the south. Uh, it runs along the Ohio River, uh, begins in, in Ashtabula uh, County uh, on Lake Erie, uh, and then runs along the Ohio River and ends up uh, almost, almost, not quite, in Cincinnati. So a big, big region, uh, 32 uh, counties. And we have a little video 
uh, that we're going to show you that's, that's been prepared uh, talks a little bit about our Appalachian part of the state of Ohio. That is a small taste of our Appalachian region. Absolutely a, a gorgeous uh, area to travel in. And we would invite everyone to take that opportunity. I was looking at the different pictures that came up on the screen. And I think Fran and I have been to, uh, I'm not sure we were at that bed and breakfast, but uh, we've not been there, but uh, we've been about everywhere else. So it's a great, great area of our state. Uh, I've been asked uh, <clears throat> before we get onto the panel to, I guess, reflect uh, about a little bit about leadership uh, during the time of the pandemic. And uh, you know, there's no no training course you go through for a pandemic. The last one we had, of course, was 102 years ago. So, uh, not exactly something you uh, you train for, nor something that that you expect. But um, a, a little, just a comment about you know, kind of how I approached it, and I, I do think that. I would never in my lifetime been through a pandemic. Uh, you know, I've served at all levels of, of, of government, um, starting as a county prosecutor, then in the state legislature and U.S. Congress. Uh, and I, I think that all of that experience has, has certainly helped me um, to, to understand, you know, how to make decisions and, and how to get things, try to get things done. Uh, first of all, anybody who's a governor uh, during this pandemic, uh, if you don't like making decisions, uh, you've been in the wrong job for the last five months. Uh, you know, governors have had the, the, not only the opportunity, but really the obligation to make a ton of decisions and to make them very, very quickly. Uh, I've relied on a couple things that I've learned throughout the years. And uh, one uh, is that when I look back on my uh, almost, I guess, 40-year career in public service, the mistakes that I've made, and I've made mistakes, uh, have come about when I didn't have enough facts, when I didn't, didn't have enough of the evidence, I didn't talk to enough people, I didn't talk to the right people. Uh, and so throughout this, we have had a search for facts um, and a search for the best information. And we've consulted a lot of people not just in Ohio, but all across the country, uh, both in the public health field, uh, in, in the area, of course, of medicine. And like everyone else, uh, every other person who's making decisions and doctors, we continue to learn as doctors learn more every day about, about this pandemic, about this particular virus, then we try to take that information and translate that into, into, into policy. Uh, the other thing I've learned uh, throughout my career is when I've made mistakes, I've also made them because I didn't trust my instinct or didn't trust my gut. Saw everybody else going the other way. I thought, you know, they can't all be wrong. Uh, so what you learn is to try to trust your instinct more. Gather all the facts. Get everything that you, you can down in your head on paper uh, and then make a decision. But, but go with your gut because so many of these decisions are just gut decisions. Uh, I'll give you just maybe two, two examples. Um, and many times what you run into when the decisions are, it's, it's two choices and e each choice is bad. You just got to figure out is what, what's the least bad, I guess, uh, with the least downside to it. Uh, there's also times when you're making decisions when there's certainly unintended consequences. Two, two examples. Uh, uh, everyone, uh, health experts recommend as soon as this uh, pandemic hit Ohio, the coronavirus hit Ohio, um, you know, we need to cut off access to nursing homes because we want to slow the rate of COVID that, that was coming into the nursing home and visitors would bring it in. We did that. Uh, it was the right decision, but 
it became apparent after a few months uh, that we were seeing some unintended consequences and their natural consequences. And that is people could not be visited. Uh, they weren't being checked on, uh, you know, particularly people who maybe didn't, uh, weren't able for some reason to use the phone, weren't able to communicate uh, on, in another fashion, uh, were isolated. Uh, and so then we had to try to figure out, okay, how do we do that? How do we protect that nursing home, protect the residents there, but at the same time get people in? And so we've, we've started, uh, started back to that, that, that path. Um, another example would be what we did yesterday, uh, which is op opened up uh, for high school students. We opened up sports, uh, contact sports for the fall. Uh, again, trying to weigh two things out. Um, you know, we all know the value of sports. Uh, we all also are what we're seeing is among our young people, uh, the reports of, of uh, mental health problems, uh, not just among young people, but everyone, but particularly among young people, mental health problems, not being able to get out, not being able to do what they've normally done. You had to weigh, weigh so the way the advantage of, of the discipline of a sport with a coach who's working with that, that mm -hmm. student athlete. Uh, versus the downside. And the downside is you obviously you're you know you very well could be increasing the risk of contracting the, the COVID. So uh, not not easy decisions. Uh, but as I said, anybody who likes making decisions, uh, you know, can be a governor during a, a pandemic. Uh, we we certainly hope we we're out of this um, into next year. Uh, we're optimistic. Um, you know, we're, we're going we're gonna to get it through this and we're going to make it. And uh, our goal is to get every Ohioan through it. And uh, so when uh, we, we see the light of day and we're out of it, that people can get back to normal and enjoy what they're doing. So again, welcome. Welcome to Ohio. Uh, welcome to this uh, session. I know we've got some interesting speakers and I look forward to uh, uh, listening to some of them. Thank you very much. Lydia, back to you. Thanks, Governor, so much uh, for, for your remarks. We're really looking forward uh, to the panel. Uh, but before we get there, we've got a couple of other introductions uh, that I need to do. Um, our next panelist is Tim Thomas. Uh, Tim is the Appalachian Regional Commission's 12th federal co-chair and works directly with ARC's 13 member governors, their state alternates and program managers, and a whole host of networks uh, of local development districts to continue creating economic opportunities in the Appalachian region. Prior to joining ARC, he served on Senator Mitch McConnell's staff, working with state and local officials, community leaders, and constituent groups to support economic and community development initiatives. He also worked at Swift and Staley, a Kentucky-based maintenance operations and environmental services company, and for the Kentucky Governor, Ernie Fletcher. With that, Mr. Thomas, you're up. Well, thank you, Lydia. Thank you so much for that introduction. And thank you to the whole Ohio team for your partnership throughout this process of putting together this showcase. Uh, this has been a challenge for us. We were obviously wanting to do this with a live conference in Ohio, but the fact that we've been able to pivot to such a great lineup of programming as we'll be presenting over the next several weeks, starting with our conversation today, it's, it's really a credit to the resilience and ingenuity of the, of the whole Ohio ARC team, uh, ably led by John Kerry, uh, I thank him for his remarks this morning and to all the ARC staff who've worked hard on all the details of this, of this showcase. But it's really no surprise that Ohio has been out front on this. Under the leadership of Governor DeWine, Ohio has been a national leader in responding to the COVID pandemic. And I feel very fortunate to have Governor DeWine as a partner as the state's co-chair for ARC this year. And I'm especially pleased that he's joining us this morning. Uh, Governor Dwine has consistently made Appalachian, Ohio a focus of his administration, and I certainly look forward to hearing more about it from him today. Now, I also want to thank the offices of Congressman Bill Johnson and Bob Gibbs of Ohio and Alex Mooney of West Virginia for being in virtual attendance today and any other congressional staff that might be joining us. Our congressional delegation has been consistently supportive of ARC and certainly during this time of COVID and we could not do the work that we do without them. So thank you to, to our congressional delegation and their staff. ARC has faced challenges this year like everyone else. 
We made a transition to full telework back in March and the staff has stepped up and performed ably in the face of adversity. Working with our state and local partners, ARC has approved more projects and processed more payments since the pandemic struck than in the same time period in the previous two years. We've also worked with grantees to approve 59 amendments to projects, allowing funds already approved and at work in the region to have a greater impact in the fight against COVID. We've also approved over $14 million in new COVID related projects. Responding to the needs of our state and local partners, we have and will continue to waive match requirements for grants responding to COVID's impact on our communities when appropriate. And we'll continue to look for ways to fill gaps to help in the COVID response, like we've done in repurposing funds toward community development financial mm -hmm. institutions and revolving loan funds that have ensured small businesses and nonprofits have the operating capital to get through lean times, saving jobs and stabilizing markets. We are also currently developing a program to offer technical assistance to nonprofits that have seen their financial situation deteriorate due to COVID. In the meantime, our regular work goes on. Uh, we have been reviewing and processing the 2020 round of Power Initiative grant applications. That's our coal impacted communities program that to date has invested over $195 million in 350 communities since its inception. Doing things like training workers, building high, span, high speed broadband infrastructure, promoting entrepreneurship and tourism, and addressing the systemic hurdles of sub substance abuse recovery. I'm excited that we will soon announce the details of a competitive pilot grant initiative to address community level gaps in the substance abuse recovery ecosystem through which individuals in recovery access the services and opportunities they need to aid their recovery and ultimately find sustainable employment, a key factor in long-term recovery. Now we have worked to ensure that those in our region who are participating in our educational opportunities don't miss out. We have moved sessions of the Appalachian Leadership Institute, the Oak Ridge Summer STEM Academy, and the inaugural session of our Appalachian Entrepreneurship Academy to virtual formats. And I'm very proud of the local leaders, educators, and students who have participated in these programs. And I know they will go on to be of great benefit to their communities. The Appalachian region will face the same challenges as many in this country in responding to COVID, but we have some tremendous opportunities as well that I'd like to, to speak of briefly. Increasingly, I see the important investments being made in energy production and manufacturing as being critical to the long-term economic growth of the region. In North Central and Central Appalachia, we have a chance to create a petrochemical industry cluster, taking advantage of the products derived and made from the natural gas extraction from the shale formations. Investments in transportation infrastructure and facilities like ethane cracker plants can mean thousands of well-paid jobs. In South Central and Southern Appalachia, automotive and aerospace manufacturing and the advanced manufacturing processes being utilized shows that our region is fast becoming a manufacturing powerhouse. The industry clusters being created, created make the region stronger and require regional planning and cooperation to mac maximize their potential. ARC will continue to make investments and convene people to make this possible. Finally, Opportunity zones, the tax incentivized investment havens in each of our states passed as part of tax reform in 2017, offer a chance for beneficial projects, many in rural areas to access private investment that may have otherwise overlooked them. During the 2019 fiscal year, 71% of ARC projects benefited an opportunity zone track in some fashion. ARC partners like Opportunity Appalachia and Opportunity Alabama have technical assistance programs to help communities attract OZ investment and promoting opportunity zones has been a priority of mine as a member of the White House Opportunity and Revitalization Council. At the end of our session today, we'll have a short video from the director of the council, Scott Turner, who was appointed by the president in 2019 to develop strategies to implement and optimize the use of federal resources connected to the Opportunity Zones incentives. I look forward to his remarks. But again, I want to thank Governor DeWine for his leadership in these challenging times. And I want to encourage each of you to join us over the coming weeks
for additional programming on issues important to strengthen, strengthening economic opportunity throughout the region. So thank you, and I'll turn it back to Director Mahalik for the next introduction. Thank you so much, Tim. That was great. Um, our, our third panelist uh, this morning is Ms. Tiffany Swigert. And she's another great local voice uh, to, add to, uh, to add to our discussion uh, this morning. And uh, she's actually the executive director of the Coshocton Port Authority, which serves as the Economic Development Resource Center for, for Coshocton County. Prior to joining Coshocton's Economic Development Office in July of 2017, she served as the executive, executive director of the Coshocton County Regional Planning Commission and the safety coordinator for the Coshocton County Commissioners. Ms. Swiger, you're up. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to start by thanking ARC for the opportunity to be a part of this panel. It's a tremendous honor to be with leaders that I hold with such high regard. Uh, Governor DeWine has led Ohio in extraordinary ways through this pandemic. And I thank each of you, Governor DeWine, Federal Co-Chair Thomas, Director Mahalik, and Director Carey for your leadership. In a time when there is so much uncertainty, I can say with absolute conviction that I've never been more proud to be born and raised in Coshocton, Ohio, an Appalachia community. In the past, I've had the privilege of uh, participating in the ARC Leadership Institute. After the first session, I knew that this was going to be a valuable yet challenging year. However, none of my 39 other fellows instructors uh, could have ever predicted or prepared adequately for the global pandemic ahead. With all sincerity, I'm so grateful for the other fellows, their leadership experiences, and their shoulder in 2020. Our Coshocton community and leadership has developed strong relationships that have resulted in excellent working partnerships. We're truly a part, everyone is truly a part of the economic development team here in Coshocton. As the devastating news was surfacing in March, these partnerships grew in strength and numbers local, regional, state, and federal support has been essential in surviving the last six months. Our office has been reasonably reactive while still focusing on the bright future that we know is ahead. Our ability to adapt to the daily changes with a positive attitude has assisted us in lifting others up while connecting them to valuable support. We understood the role that we could play and we asked what we could do that would provide the best possible outcomes. We also understood the roles that were not ours to play and how we could serve as a contact or a connection to those that could produce the best possible outcomes. For example, when PPP benefits became available to our local businesses, we showered them with information on who could produce their application successfully and what needed to be done for those conversations to effectively take place. We listened, we learned, we grew, we cried a little, we admitted when we were wrong and then we changed the path that we were on in an effort to correct it. Coshocton is no stranger to struggle. Our community has shown much resilience in the past decades as our industrial base had began to decline, much like other small rural communities, thus resulting in some economic decline. But we've pulled ourselves up, we've created pathways for success, and then we celebrate hard when those uh, results become fruitful. Coshocton is full of dedicated people with huge hearts and incredible visions. And admittedly, I had moments of sadness and fear as we graduated our oldest son, Briar, this year from Coshocton High School. But I knew that we were gonna be okay when dozens of people in Coshocton started making masks and distributing them to others. I knew that we were gonna be okay when there was over an hour wait for a drive through line to get popcorn from our local Shelby movie theater. And when local manufacturers stopped normal production and began making hand, sanit hand sanitizers for our frontline workers. When churches live streamed services and impacted families right in their own living rooms and schools celebrated their student success with parades. See, this is why we choose Coshocton, Ohio, an Appalachian community, and why we know that we'll be stronger on the other side of this pandemic. Thank you, Lydia. You're welcome, Tiffany. Uh, well done. Uh, thank you for those opening remarks. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and get started uh, with the panel. We've got some great questions. And then I want to remind you as well, we have some prepared questions and then we want to take questions uh, from the audience. So if you have anything that you'd like to ask our panelists, go ahead and use the question and answer function um, down there in the Zoom uh, taskbar. So our first question is for Governor DeWine uh, and Mr. Thomas. 
Um, although uh, the pandemic uh, and its effects continue to be a challenge and surprise, uh, was there anything about the region or a specific community that made it especially resilient to this unique situation? Governor? Well, I think the people of Appalachia, uh, you know, are people who've been sometimes through some difficult situations. Um, uh, you know, as, as Tiffany described a moment ago, um, you know, we've seen a change uh, in manufacturing. We've seen a change in, in many things in Appalachia. Uh, but the people are resilient. I mean, Tiffany's examples of what is going on in Coshocton is, I think, a really a good good example of that uh lydia i know you and you and john uh worked on a stem program so let me just uh, briefly throw it back to you can you tell everybody about the stem program yeah sure governor um actually this was a um an incredible idea uh, that director Carry uh, brought forward. So um, we, we were able to, to really uh, have some influence on the youth uh, in the region uh, and was really out of the box thinking. So Director Carey, why don't you just give a quick brief uh, summary of what that is? Sure. Um, Tasha Wary and her team at Building Bridges to Careers in Marietta has done a fantastic job. And it's a model that we want to replicate and so uh, we shared with students all the way from uh, Eastgate region near Youngstown to Claremont County in Cincinnati and brought uh, students in to deal with uh, STEM experiences, a great success. And now they're reacting, uh, doing it virtually. So uh, we think this will be something that other regions in the state and then in the region can continue to do. Thank you. Very much. Governor, did you have anything else to add? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I do. I mean, I, one of the things that, uh, one of the big picture lessons I think this country needs to take away from this pandemic uh, is that we never, ever again want to be in a position where we can't make personal protection equipment uh, in the United States. And so we've kind of focused in Ohio and said, we're not going to, whatever happens in the future, we're going to be making this stuff. Um, and so, you know, we've got, I wrote down here a few e examples. Um, you know, uh, Soul Choice in Portsmouth, working on PPE projects, uh, specifically masks. Shawnee State, um, one of our great state universities, that students in the plastic engineering program made face shields for local hospitals, as, as well as hospitals in Kentucky and West Virginia. Uh, Shawnee State is going to, in the, as we move forward, we use funding uh, from ARC and our state Appalachian program to expand this effort. Uh, local developmental districts uh, work uh, very quickly to help communities purchase PPE uh, and apply for grants that are available. Um, so these are things that, you know, I think bode well for the future. Uh, we're always going to need PPE, whether we have a pandemic or not. Um, and Lydia, you and I have worked on this and talked about this, and John has, and it's just something that we want Ohio to be known as a place where we make PPE. And uh, our manufacturers have come forward. Some have done things that are uh, temporary, where they've re really converted from what they were doing over to, to make the PPE. But others are now seeing this as an opportunity uh, to get permanently in the business. And uh, we're, we're pretty excited about that. Thank you, Governor. Uh, Tim, anything to add there? I think you're muted. <laughs> We're still having difficulties hearing you. <laughs> Let's see here. All right, there you go. There, there you are. Now we can hear. All right. Is, is the sound okay? Okay, very good. Uh, I just want to agree with the governor uh, on that, the point about uh, the people of Appalachia are very resilient. Uh, they have a, a history, a long history of overcoming various challenges. Uh, I think if you look up the word resilient in the dictionary, it probably says, see Appalachia. 
So this is just another challenge that's come our way and, and the people of Appalachia are showing they're up to the challenge, certainly with able leadership, such as Governor DeWine and others in, in other states. Um, what has really interested me in this dynamic, and I look at it from a, a little different perspective, is the urban rural dynamic of COVID. Uh, Appalachia, even though we do have some urban centers such as Pittsburgh and Birmingham, Alabama, and even Knoxville, Tennessee, we're primarily rural. And uh, as, as COVID unfolded, it of course started on the coast and in the larger urban centers. And that, that rural kind of has, it's a double-edged sword. So, so it was not quite as uh, fast to spread in the rural areas, although we knew it was coming to the rural areas. And that rural aspect perhaps gave us a little bit more time uh, for our local communities to, to perhaps plan. Now, did we use that time uh, as, as best we could? I think that's still an open question and something that we will have to look at uh, uh, with post-action reviews and so forth. But uh, the rural aspect, it's a double-edged sword. And I think that uh, it really comes into play with uh, issues like COVID. So um, it's going to be very interesting to see um, that dynamic. Uh, we are learning that uh, you don't necessarily have to be physically located in the urban core areas to do your work. Uh, might that change the dynamic going forward of, of people moving to the urban areas if they do have the ability to do the same work remotely, perhaps in a more rural setting? Of course, you have to have certain uh, uh, infrastructure in place to do that, but it's going to be very interesting to watch going forward. So I think all those things can play into to the resilience of Appalachia. Thank you uh, for that. Very, very good. And uh, infrastructure and making sure that we have uh, the things in place so that we can take advantage of the new digital world uh, is certainly important for the administration to continue to focus on. We're going to get that thing solved. Uh, I, can, I can promise you that. So our second question uh, here is for Tiffany uh, and, and Tim as well. Um, Tiffany, what are some economic development uh, adaptations that you've made as a result uh, of the COVID-19 crisis? I think um, probably some of the obvious that all of us on this call today could agree on is uh, we may have become masters at Zoom uh, meetings and other platforms for sure. Um, I, we had kind of used the words earlier, reasonably reactive. Um, and I think that's a good description in that when you're dealing with an enormity of a crisis like this, it's hard to feel like you're doing enough um, the Coshocton Port Authority realized quickly the stress that would be on our younger and newer businesses um, as the end of March was approaching and their revenue was declining. We were able to leverage our existing relationships to establish an emergency relief fund. Uh, Coshocton Foundation, the Rotary Club, the Bar Association, and many other uh, contributed to this fund. We even had a local jeweler, Dean's Jewelry, that created a flat in the curve pendant and ring, and the profits from those sales come to our emergency relief fund to help others. Uh, we were able to reach out again through local partnerships, through our Chamber of Commerce, to reach some of these businesses that we knew uh, would be significantly impacted. We created a simple application um, and program that assisted our for-profit businesses with their mortgage, their lease, or their utility expenses. Um, our local United Way was able to assist with our nonprofits in a very similar type of program. The program was able to assist 50 local businesses over a three month period. Um, and if I might take a minute to just really promote the ARC Leadership Institute, this program was much easier to get off the ground in such a short amount of time um, because I was able to recall a conversation that I had with another ARC fellow. Uh, he had actually created a very similar program in 2008 for his community businesses. Um, I guess this just goes to show how essential networking can be and that you may never know when you need those resources uh, to come to mind because they're desperately needed. Very good. Thank you, uh, Tiffany. Um, Tim, anything to add there? Economic development adaptations that you've made as a oh, result I, of COVID-19. Oh, absolutely. Uh, one thing that became quite apparent to us is the, uh, the support the nonprofits throughout the region were going to need and that ARC was in a particular uh, able spot to be able to help with that. We, we are fairly nimble as far as a, as a bureaucratic organization and we were able to, to pivot and, and move some money to, to our nonprofits, realizing the work that they do in our communities. Uh, we, we were able to get them not only financial assistance, but we're also standing up a technical assistance program to help 
uh, assorted nonprofits throughout the region, help them weather the storm during these very lean times. Um, some of the things we've done that we haven't traditionally done in the past is uh, uh, helping with uh, pop-up internet access, uh, uh, Wi-Fi hotspots for, for uh, uh, school children so that they'll be able to continue their, their curriculum uh, as the fall term starts up. Uh, so we, we really had to utilize our nimbleness, uh, the creativity of the staff, of our local partners. And I, I've been very pleased, even though we have, as anyone else, limited resources, I've been very pleased with the investments we've been able to make to this point and those yet to come. Very good. You know, when, uh, when I was in Findlay, we used to call it the Findlay formula, and it was the private sector, government, and, um, and nonprofits working together uh, to get things done. And it's great uh, to hear that, that those things are happening uh, across the region uh, during such a very difficult, difficult time. So our third question, uh, and we've kind of covered a little bit uh, about this, uh, but maybe we could be uh, a little more specific. And this question is uh, for, for Governor DeWine uh, and uh, for Tiffany. Uh, although the pandemic and its effects continue to be a challenge and a surprise, uh, was there anything about the region uh, or a specific community that you have in mind that made Appalachia especially vulnerable to this very unique uh, situation? Governor. Lydia, thank you. Uh, you know, eight years as Attorney General, uh, one of the things that we saw uh, tragically develop was the opioid crisis. Uh, and it, we really started seeing it uh, first in Appalachia. So I, I think that, you know, our Appalachian communities have, have had this opiate problem that they've had to deal with. Now you have the pandemic uh, laid on, on top of that. And they have been, as we talked about, resilient. Uh, people have really come together. I've always used Portsmouth, for example, as an example of where people came together to start fighting back in regard to the, the opioid problem. Uh, still remains a problem, been acerbated probably, uh, or definitely it has been by you know, the pandemic. So I think that's a, a, you know, a particular uh, concern. Uh, you know, one of the things that when we look at our Appalachian region, we look at all Ohio, but you know, we have a million people who don't have good broadband service. Uh, and many, many of them are in our Appalachian communities. And so this is a particular concern when we, you know, we go back to school and we're starting back to school and most of the Appalachian um, school districts are planning on doing it in person. Uh, but we also know that they may at some point have to flip back to online. And that is a, a unique challenge for them. It's also a challenge sometimes in our cities because families don't have the, you know, the, the access. It may be in the community, but the families don't have that. So uh, one of the things that I know, Lydia, you have been working on along with the, with the Lieutenant Governor uh, is what we call our Broadband Ohio Connectivity Grant. Uh, we just got this started, but it's $50 million a program for schools, uh, but we're also to help them, but we're also looking, frankly, uh, one of the things we hope to come out of this pandemic with a, a real uh, pathway uh, to dealing with the, the million Ohioans who don't have this now. Uh, because if they're gonna work uh, and they're gonna live uh, in the 21st century, uh, you know, they really need to do that. One of the things that we've seen during the pandemic is people's ability to work remotely. Uh, you know, I, I think that you'll, there'll be people working remotely five years from now, 10 years from now uh, in these different jobs because they found out that sometimes they could be even more productive if they're doing that. So if, if our Appalachian region is to, is to stay up and if it's going to be a place where people can live and work remotely, uh, obviously you're going to have to have, you know, the broadband. So that's our challenge. Um, we're making progress. We have, we have a ways to go, but it, it's one of the, I think the, it, the good things that may come out of this pandemic is a real push on all of us to do what we know that we need to do anyway, and that is to make sure every Ohioan uh, has access to broadband. Very good, very good. And I'll tell you, Governor, as, a, as an extreme extrovert, working remotely is driving me insane. <laughs> so I really look forward to the time when we can all get back together again. Tiffany, well, do you have anything? Go ahead, well, Governor. Well, 
the good the good news is you get to have a background. See, I'm I'm looking at the Ohio River there. I mean, you know, it's great. You know, we can you can have all kinds of backgrounds. But uh, yeah, it's uh, it it somebody who likes to go out uh, as I do and meet with people and hear from people directly. Uh, and now you know I'm doing it all by phone, and phone's fine, yeah. and we do that, but it's different. So now, yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, it's tough for us. It's tough. Well, Tiffany, uh, anything to add? Uh, something uh, about maybe the Coshocton community uh, or or other communities in the region that you may have come in contact with um, that that you you think uh, have been especially vulnerable to this very unique situation? Yeah. You know, I think, um, especially in our more rural regions, just our density, number one, um, you know, we don't have a, a hospital necessarily within just a few blocks of each home. Um, and so we are very blessed here in Coshocton to have some excellent healthcare uh, resources, but maybe highlighted um, issues such as access to healthcare in some areas, access, uh, just transportation can maybe even become a little bit more of a challenge. Uh, we do really like to kind of turn that on its head though, and then also talk about our strengths in an area where we may have that less density. We also have got uh, plenty of room for outdoor recreation here um, and social distancing. And so that's definitely been a way that we've overcome some of those challenges. Um, and we also look at those heightened issues and now know what a priority those must be in the future. Very good. Very good, Tiffany. Thank you. You know, did, did you happen to engage um, any new partners in order to meet COVID specific uh, challenges? And if you did, uh, tell us how, uh, how you engaged them. We certainly did engage new partners. Um, I think that what, what was really important was that we um, did that really through the existing partnerships with um, our already established uh, local economic development partners, regional partners, and state partners. Um, and so thankfully, they really stepped up to the plate. Those are entities like Jobs Ohio, Ohio Southeast, um, Omega, um, and Appalachia Growth Capital that hosted webinars for us on a regular basis, um, did blast emails uh, to really help us sort through um, really the enormity of information that we were receiving. Um, I know many of you on this call may be from small offices like mine, um, and our time was just stretched because we were trying to stay up to date on everything that we possibly could in an effort to share that information with our small businesses. Um, and so luckily we had those really great established personal relationships with our local partners. Through them, we were able to cultivate some new relationships that uh, certainly proved beneficial immediately, but will continue to cultivate and be more beneficial in the future. Thanks, Tiffany. And we're getting ready to go into our final question here. And I just want to remind everyone that, that if you have a question that you would like uh, to ask, um, please go ahead and utilize that question and answer uh, feature there down in the Zoom taskbar. And uh, we'll see if we've got some time to get through as many of them as we can. So finally, uh, for Governor uh, DeWine uh, and for Tim, um, what is your long-term vision uh, for a post-COVID economic development strategy? And how uh, can we help prepare uh, for that future? Well, part of it, uh, I think, really does for Appalachia, Ohio, uh, depend on the broadband that we talked about. I think that's, that's really uh, essential. Uh, I think we're going to see, you know, in Appalachia, a mixed economy, um, and I think that's, you know, that's probably the right, the right vision. But the broadband will will certainly help. But also, uh, there's more potential in regard to manufacturing. We talked about PPE. Uh, I really do believe that, you know, we can be a center of PPE, and a lot of that PPE I see is, frankly, being developed in 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 Appalachia. Uh, I just think it's a real uh, opportunity for us to to bring back more um, manufacturing. Ohio still remains a, a huge manufacturing state. Uh, if you look at look at our production, uh, what has changed over the years, of course, is simply the number of people it takes to produce that that particular item, and that has been something that has changed. But I know, Lydia, you have worked uh, to st stand up this grant program. Uh, that you referenced a little bit ago, and I just maybe give everybody a, a, a little more information about it. Um, you know, we have a, a, certainly a strong, strong uh, manufacturing history in Ohio and in Appalachia, uh, and we want to build on 
that. So we've allocated $20 million uh, to this program. Uh, 68 companies will receive grants. Uh, we've had more demand, frankly, than we've had funds. That's a, always, always a good problem to have. Uh, and we have you know, companies from Appalachia um, and go through uh, Stitches USA in, in Tuscaroras County. Uh, dinosaur Plastics in, in Niles in, in Trumbull County, DK Manufacturing in Muskingum County, Phoenix Quality Manufacturing, Jackson County, and there's, and there's more. But these are things that I, I think that, you know, we can focus on. And whenever you have a, a, a tragedy, and, and this pandemic has to be with the number of people who, who have died, people have become very, very sick. Uh, label a huge, huge tragedy uh, of epic proportions for this country. Uh, part of our challenge is, is not only to save as many lives as we can, protect people, uh, but to also to look to the future and kind of resolve what, what have we learned from this. And as I said, you know, one thing we've learned is we never want to be dependent on China or anyplace else to get our PPE. Uh, you know, we have the, the potential in Ohio to become um, not only the producer of PPE, but a great producer of all things having to do uh, with medical supplies. Um, you know, we have a huge number of people employed in Ohio in, in our hospitals, our clinics. Um, you know, we are really have great brains in this state. And so the opportunity to expand in Appalachia and other parts of the state in regard to medical, med, all kinds of medical supplies is, is certainly, uh, certainly there. The other big lesson, uh, of course, is that we again have to fund our health, uh, public health. We've got to do it nationwide. Uh, you know, we've got to do it uh, in the state. And we've got to do it in the local level. So we come out of this pandemic. We will come out of it. And, you know, future is very bright, I think, for Appalachia, uh, Ohio, Appalachia, the rest of the country, um, the rest of the states in, in, this, in this region. So I'm, I'm optimistic. Uh, I think we have a great future ahead of us, and uh, you know it's good being with everybody today. And thanks, thanks for uh, sharing the uh, uh, the panel, Lydia. You're and welcome, thanks, Governor. Thanks for, it's thanks, my pleasure to be on here. Thanks, it's Tiffany. My pleasure. Appreciate it. All right, uh, Tim. Anything to add there in terms of economic development strategy for the future? Uh, sure. I, I think it's important that we understand the correlation between our, our short-term needs and our long-term challenges, because there, there definitely is an, an interrelation there. Um, new challenges don't make your old challenges go away, so you have to figure out how to balance those things. And the challenges and the things that we have been working on within the region for a number of years are, are actually very pertinent to, to, the, to the current COVID situation, uh, whether it's basic infrastructure of all sorts, including broadband, entrepreneurship, you know, who's going to start and launch these uh, uh, medical product companies in the future, um, diversifying the economies generally, all of those things uh, would make us more resilient to the next pandemic, uh, God forbid that there is one, but uh, just diversifying and increasing our resilience uh, is so important as, as we continue to, to grow as a region. And again, I come back to uh, uh, the potential petrochemical industry cluster. All the things we've talked about, the PPE, that's made from petrochemicals. And Appalachian, Ohio, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, you're right there in the heart of, of this, this industry that's just on the cusp of, of, of burgeoning there. And you can have a debate about energy. And we have that debate going on in the country. But there's nothing that's going to displace plastics. If you're going to have a modern society, you have to have plastics. And we need to make that in this country. We need to make it in Appalachia and we can make it in Appalachia. So I just see all of this as interrelated and I am also very enthusiastic about the future of Appalachia. So thank you. Yeah, no, you're welcome. Good remarks there. So we've got, I think, just maybe a couple of minutes here to try and take a few questions that we received uh, from, from the audience uh, that's been listening in. And I've got a good one for you, Tiffany. I think you might like this. Uh, it actually came uh, to directly to you. Um, what new approaches do you think the under 35s will be undertaking that build on, uh, but change up your elders' approaches uh, to our challenges currently? Good luck with that one. <laughs> that is a great question. Um, we actually have just very recently here in our community started a program called Three for Three. Um, this is a community-driven economic development group 
um, that works also with our local governments, our Port Authority, our tourism. Um, it, it truly is a huge team effort, but it is, it's community driven. Um, I think too many times we don't necessarily empower our youth um, and let them speak and be a part of some of these processes and, and that may be our fault. Um, I found that if you ask them to participate, engage, we have got some very, very smart young people in our community that are very driven and passionate. And um, they also need mentors. They need mentors that have been successful in the business world um, where they can learn together. This th three for three group essentially is our top three priorities for our community in the next three years. Um, we're really excited about that, but it is simply just engaging them, sitting down, having good communication with them, um, and all parties being capable of learning from each other. Very good. Uh, the next question is for Tim. Um, as people continue uh, to struggle uh, with substance abuse, how have you adapted your leadership strategies to continue substance abuse services during the COVID crisis? That's a very good question. Uh, and let me point out, and the governor touched upon this, uh, you know, part of recovery from substance abuse is establishing and maintaining supportive relationships. And that's very hard to do when, when the health mandate is social distancing. So it's been particularly challenging for those in recovery. Uh, ARC, we are, 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 of course, we have our, our uh, Substance Abuse Advisory Council that we've been heavily relying upon. We are standing up a new program for uh, uh, pilot grants for our substance abuse community to try new and innovative approaches, particularly in the, in the COVID environment. So uh, we're very cognizant of the challenges uh, to our, our recovery community uh, during these times, and, and we are pre uh, prepared to help and want to help. Thank you for that. And uh, we'll wrap up uh, the question and answer from the audience here. I'm gonna go back to Tiffany again, and then I'm gonna let the governor uh, take us out with the last question. Um, so Tiffany, um, what are some success strategies that have helped connect people to outdoor recreational assets uh, in terms of economic development uh, in the region? So I can certainly say for myself that I've spent more time outdoors um, exploring the amazing things that are right here in our state and in our backyard here in Coshocton. Um, we have an incredible CVB here. Um, our Visitors Bureau, they know all of the best sites and of course they are using social media uh, to highlight those, uh, to talk to people about the trails that are able um, to be here. Obviously it hits the mark with social distancing um, but we really lean on those existing relationships, again, with people like our CVB, historic Roscoe Village is right here in Coshocton County as well, um, to highlight the successes that they have, the interesting things that people can do with their children here, still social distance and mask up uh, to be safe. And so uh, utilizing those existing relationships and certainly social media has been our best friend through all of this. Thank you for that. Tiffany, well, I can do uh, as, as development is the home to tourism in Ohio. We've been directed to put a lot of attention and effort specifically around tourism uh, in the region. So we've got those um, that whatever you're looking for, uh, you can find it. You can find it here uh, in Ohio. Uh, Governor, we're going to let you take us out uh, with this one. Uh, if there is one thing. Uh, that you would want those joining us to take away from this particular conversation about leadership and community resilience uh, this morning, what would it be? Well, I'm biased, uh, but I think Ohioans are extremely resilient and tough and strong. And uh, you know, when we asked them early on to um, slow this virus down, they did it. They stayed home. They did what they needed to do. Um, you know, our challenge, uh, not only in Ohio, but across the country now is, is we've opened back up uh, to be able to continue to, to kind of follow that, uh, that, that discipline. But, um, you know, I want to go back, if I could, um, to your comment about being outdoors. Um, uh, Mary Mertz, who's our director of the Ohio Department of Natural Resources, uh, tells me that we're up dramatically with the number of people going to our state parks. I'm sure that's true in our metro parks, our county park systems. Uh, so people are, are kind of discovering for the first time what really is out there. And, and probably the most, uh, you know, underutilized area in Ohio is Appalachia. 
um, you know, the hockey hills are red hot and, uh, you know, people, people are going to the, the park and, and people are going to Old Man's Cave and that's wonderful. Uh, but there's so many other places besides that. Uh, and so many of them in Appalachia where you, you know, you can get away from it all. You can go for a bed and breakfast for one night or you could go for a whole weekend or go for a whole week or two weeks in one of our magnificent state parks. So uh, tourism is something that, um, you know, it really is, uh, as I said, we've really seen an increase in people, Ohioans kind of staying home, but going to their state parks. But it's a, it's a really uh, amazing asset that we have. It's good for economic development. Uh, it's good for job creation. And it's good for leisure and recreation and just a place to get away. So, uh, you know, to everyone who's watching, uh, thanks for taking this little trip to Ohio. If you're not from Ohio, uh, if you are from Ohio, just remember all the great places that we have in Ohio and all the great things that we can do. Uh, I'm making a mental list of the things I want to do, uh, you know, when the pandemic is over with. <laughs> and, uh, but you don't have to wait. You can get outside now and uh, you can go to the parks and you can get out and walk and hike and fish and, uh, uh, one of the things that uh, I, I did the other day with uh, with with uh, grandson, um, you know, we went into um, the new area uh, that the state has bought. Uh, that used to be the AEP property. It's huge. Uh, it has uh, plenty of places to fish. Over 300 lakes. 300 lakes. Um, we caught a few fish, none too big. But uh, these are just great, great, great opportunities that we have out there. So, thanks for joining us and. Uh, we're sorry you, you can't be here in person in Marietta. Thanks, thank Lydia. You, thank you so much, thank you. Governor. Uh, thank you uh, to ARC co-chair uh, Tim Thomas and executive director Tiffany Swigert. You guys have been incredible. I think we've done a great job here, and it's the first of, of, of a few of these sessions that are going to really highlight the region, and we're just happy uh, that Ohio is playing uh, a supportive role in everything that's going on. And so uh, with that, I think Director uh, John Kerry, I'm going to turn it back over to you and you're going to close us out. Great. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you to all the participants and the speakers today. I just want to uh, remind you to stick around in just a moment. We're going to hear from Scott Turner to talk about opportunity zones and their potential impact on the region. Today, we've heard about innovation and ingenuity in response to COVID in the Appalachian region. Next week, we'll be talking about recovery to work, what the governor and uh, the federal co-chair talked about. And we had businesses, not only from Ohio and uh, uh, people that are working on that issue from the Appalachian region. I think it'll be worth your time to register for that at arc.gov. And then the following weeks, we'll be talking about infrastructure and tourism. So we're excited about that. ARC will post this session on its website. Uh, they've asked me to remind you that you'll be receiving it today, a uh, survey today on today's session. Please take a moment to complete. And with that, now let us hear from Scott Turner. Hello everyone, this is Scott Turner. I send greetings to you from Dallas, Texas. I hope that you and your families are doing very well in these unprecedented times in our country. I also wanna say thank you to the ARC for this invitation to address the conference and to our federal co-chair, Mr. Tim Thomas. Thank you, sir, for your leadership, your tireless work, and also for extending the hand of invitation to speak today. To all of our economic development professionals that are on the call and conference today, I wanna to say to you also how much I appreciate your work and your leadership and your efforts. As we know, and I know all too well, this is a not an easy task. It's not an easy assignment that we have been given to serve and to lift up, if you will, by way of economic development and community impact, our most vulnerable communities and most distressed communities in America, in particularly our rural communities for the purpose of today's conference. And I wanna say thank you for your work and for your efforts, for your strategizing, for your convening together for the many hours that you have spent to make these communities the best that they can be and to serve the most wonderful people of the Appalachia uh, in our country today. So for me to you, thank you uh, for what you are doing. We have 737 opportunity zones throughout Appalachia, including Ohio, Pennsylvania, and North Carolina. And when I look at these, that's 737 
opportunities to bring about real revitalization and transformation to our rural communities and the citizens that occupy these neighborhoods and communities. And so I'm excited uh, that the White House Opportunity and Revitalization Council is moving ahead. Prior to COVID, we were in full motion, full steam in serving our country. During COVID, I want you to know that we have not stopped. Although I have not been on the road as much as I was prior to the shutdowns across our country, we have been conducting Zoom calls and team calls and webinars and conferences, disseminating information, strategizing, answering questions in our urban, rural, tribal communities all across the country as it pertains to Opportunity Zones. In April, President Trump, who is extremely focused uh, on our rural communities, asked Dr. Ben Carson, Secretary Carson, who is the chairman of this council, to broaden the council's reach and outlook to include the whole of the distressed community, including Opportunity Zones, and a major focus for our rural communities in America as it pertains to broadband, as it pertains to education and expanding education to our young people that are inside of rural communities, as it pertains to healthcare and the access to healthcare resources in our rural communities. And I want you all to know that when you look at Opportunity Zones, a lot of the rhetoric, a lot of the speak uh, has been in the urban areas, has been in areas that are often talked about. From, but from our standpoint, from the White House Opportunity and Revitalization Council, from the agencies that serve on the council, including the ARC, we have always had a tremendous focus on our rural areas. And if you look at our best practices report, which was recently published on opportunityzones.gov, you will see some of the work that has been done, the highlights that have been done inside of our rural communities and opportunity zones. And I encourage you to take time out and to study the best practices report, which is on our website and see the actions of the council and the things that have been done inside of our rural communities. The council has effectuated almost 300 action items as a whole for resources to be targeted inside of opportunity zones, including our rural communities. Here recently, I was in Baxter, Tennessee. Baxter, Tennessee uh, has a population, I believe, of 1,391 citizens. You know, it's a rural area of Tennessee. And along with Baxter, two other cities came. Uh, South Pittsburgh came and also Mountain City, uh, Tennessee, were there uh, for an EDA uh, a grant award presentation because each of those cities received an EDA grant for infrastructure and for job creation. And I say this because this is an example right there during the, the shutdown, during COVID, that we were in a rural communities, three rural communities together, coming together to celebrate EDA grants and infrastructure and building and new businesses coming to these places to bring about transformation. And I'll say that to encourage you to be uh, steadfast in your work, to be continually using this tool of opportunity zones to bring about business and infrastructure and new job creation inside of our rural communities. One thing that I have, have come to appreciate even greater with opportunity zones, be it urban, be it tribal, be it rural. When we have a tool such as this, and when people in our country use their God-given skills and talents and crafts and come together with a tool such as this, real results have happened across this country. A lot of fruit as it pertains to economic development, as it pertains to job creation, as it pertains to infrastructure, as it pertains to community impact have come about with Opportunity Zones across our nation and including our rural communities. And I say that to you all, not just as an encouragement, but also as a challenge. Opportunity Zones work. It's not easy. It's a different type of investment. It's a different type of strategy. But we have real life examples that this tool is benefiting the citizens of this country 
businesses in this country, both existing and the creation of new ones, housing, retail, manufacturing, so on and so forth inside of Opportunity Zone. And it's been very humbling to see these things come to pass. The opportunity to steward this council has been something for me that has not only been eye-opening, but something that has given me great joy to be a part, just a small part of this team, to bring about this type of transformation in our country. And with that, I wanna to say to you all, keep up the great work, keep pressing, keep moving, keep striving, keep working together and collaborating together from a regional perspective, from a city pers perspective, from local leadership, to, to mayors, to economic development, to faith leaders, to education leaders, community leaders, business and, and development coming together for real strategies to utilize this tool called Opportunity Zones to build up the community, to help those to reach their God-given potential and to bring new life and new energy in our rural developments and rural communities across America. Keep it up. If I can do anything for you, please, don't allow to reach out to me and my team, and we will do everything we can to make sure that you're successful. God bless you. Thank you, uh, ARC, for your leadership and the investments that you have made in the Appalachian region and beyond to make sure that there's great success stories to last for long-term sustainability and generational impact. I really appreciate all your efforts. Uh, God bless you and your families, and I hope to see you real soon.